Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Ryan, and on behalf of Oxford Global and Chromatid, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. Today's webinar is led by Chromatid, and join, joining the presentation is uh, Dr. Lin Lauren Kinner Bebal, Principal Development Scientist, Dr. David Sebasta, Chief Commercial Officer, and Henry Sebasta, Business Development Manager. After the presentation, we will have 10 minutes for Q&A sessions. Please submit your questions through the chat option on the bottom of your menu display. The full recording of the webinar will be made available to download on our secured site, and the details will be sent to you shortly after the webinar. So without further ado, let's begin, and I'll hand over to David. Thanks for the introduction. This is David Sebesta speaking, um, and thanks very much to everyone in attendance taking time out of their uh, uh, out of their day to learn about what we're up to here at Chromatid. Um, I'm going to get us started with a brief introduction to the company, a little bit about how we um, find ourselves here doing what we do. I'll introduce our technology and a little bit about why we're so excited about the potential. Um, then I'll hand it over to my colleague, Dr. Loren kenner Bibo, who will share some of our latest results and especially focus on various analyses of genomic inserts and transgenes. So Chromatid is a Colorado-based company. Um, it was established to commercialize intellectual property licensed from Colorado State University. Our platform is called Directional Genomic Hybridization, or DGH, and we offer products and services based on various embodiments of DGH and the experience and expertise of our teams of engineers, biologists, and chemists. So DGH enables high resolution and unique measurements of genomic structure and, and our passion as an organization is to collaborate with our customers and really provide synergistic and complementary expertise to their own strengths, where we help them answer key questions about the structural consequences of their cellular engineering processes. Uh, but first, a little bit of um, the, the history of the organization. Um, the DGH was originally developed as a radiation biology tool for studying the effects of ionizing radiation on chromosomal structure. And a lot of the early funding for the, um, for the technology and the researchers um, and, and chromatid actually came from NASA. And in fact, to this day, the technology is used on all of the astronauts that go to the International Space Station as part of ongoing studies characterizing the risks of space travel. So you may have heard about the NASA twin study where um, there are identical twin astronauts, um, the Kelly brothers. Uh, one of them spends a year in space, International Space Station, while the other served as the earthbound, you know, genetically equivalent control subject. And one of the many comparative tests carried out on these two um, was done with our technology in the lab of our scientific co-founder, Professor Susan Bailey. Um, when that comprehensive study was published in Science in 2019, um, there were, you know, 50 co-authors on this paper, but somehow Susan ended up nominated as the face of the thing. And for a couple of days, she was on NPR and CNN and Good Morning America, while they, you know, kind of had a lot of fanfare associated with that study. So that was really kind of fun for, for her and all of us at, uh, at Chromatid. However, um, as a business, there's really only so many people visiting deep space, and we need to identify broader markets for, you know, our particular robust approach to finding and measuring structural variants. Um, and in fact, most of the uh, most of the work that we do these days is in the area of engineered cells, especially in support of gene therapies development. This very busy slide is intended to provide an overview of the types of applications that our offerings address in the gene therapy space now, and then um, you know, kind of uh, tease a little bit about where we see the platform evolving and, and some of the real potential for the fully mature version of the platform. So you know, we're agnostic with respect to the engineering or editing technique, and it's this, this versatility that makes DGH a useful and widely applicable tool from the research stage through preclinical development. DGH brings a lot of value to the gene edit base by enabling unique single cell structural measurements in both targeted and unbiased assay designs. Um, we can confirm an intended 
as well as any unintended structural changes associated with any um, cellular engineering approach. Just as importantly, um, as a quantitative technique with a tunable sensitivity, DGH can be used to confirm the absence of structural changes as well. And we really like to emphasize this point. Um, this is a test where you can answer the question, how do you know you didn't mess something up elsewhere within the genome as a result of your process? So we always like to make that point. Um, we currently support customer regulatory filings and our quality management systems and operational mindset um, are really informed by the pharma and large biopharma experience and backgrounds of our leadership team. So we've learned a lot about the potential of DGA through the working relationships we have with now dozens of customers, including many of the leading editing companies and, uh, and a number of the top 10, top 20 global pharma organizations as well. And to realize that future potential, we're very committed as a company to the development of the platform through investment. And we have the objective of really creating standardized assay formats um, that are gonna be out there driven by you know, automation and AI um, driven uh, image analysis made widely available to provide you know, high value testing across the industry. This type of testing is gonna enable the field to think about variation in new ways because we're measuring things that have never been possible to measure before, we're going to be able to establish, you know, structure variation metrics that support um, developments in, in not just gene therapy, but in, in other areas as well. Our ultimate goal, um, to be honest, is to support every gene therapy development program from the bench to the clinic and to test every patient receiving gene therapies. Um, Beyond that, by scaling the capability and testing infrastructure, there's many functional genomic and diagnostic applications for high resolution structural measurements that exist out there across the biomedical landscape. So what I've got here is a kind of a pipeline view of our current offerings and plans. Um, we'll go into how it works in a little more detail later, but you know, our DGH platform is really a combination of a probe design approach and a sample preparation method. And probe design is supported by our pr proprietary bioinformatics tools, and we can design targeted probes or unbiased paints for any published reference genome. Um, we've done applications in a lot of different species, obviously humans, but also mice, rats, uh, canine genome, CHO cells, pigs, um, and, and multiple non-human primates. So we have targeted branded products um, that uh, like include Pinpoint Fish as well as DGH Insight. Um, and we also have unbiased assay approaches that we call DH Screen. These custom assays are commercially available now. These provide the basis for our assay services and those services span from the research stage, the discovery stage through GLP preclinical applications at present. Uh, finally, we have a uh, new IP under development, um, driven in part by grant funding from both the NHGRI as well as uh, uh, NCATS for next generation of the platform, and we call that DGH Discover. Ultimately, the ability to mine um, genomic structural metadata, you know, by direct analogy to the approaches taken with sequence data today, promises to deliver high value to the market as well. So we have big plans. As things currently stand today, our business is primarily based on custom research, development, and testing services, and the vast majority of that work is dedicated to gene therapy-related projects. So, so what's the unmet need that we kind of map into um, you know, with respect to the development of gene therapies? In a general sense, you know, the need for better, higher resolution measurements of key drug product attributes is always going to be a thing. Um, any new approaches will require wide adoption and acceptance. Um, they'll require a clear demonstration of filling an existing gap or, or clearly improving upon current approaches. And our intuitions were that a need exists within the gene therapy field for more accurate and powerful measurements of genomic rearrangements. 
Um, the current gold standard is the, the mid-century vintage G banding, as well as, uh, you know, 80s, 90s um, level fish type assays. So to confirm this intuition, we've gained a kind of a broad-based front lines perspective by working with a number of leading companies that make up our customer base. We've also leaned heavily on guidance from regulators as well as uh, available primary literature. And there's an especially comprehensive World Health Organization-led study involving a consortium of institutions and companies uh, from a couple of years ago. And shown here is the paragraph from that report acknowledging that there are significant limitations inherent to the PCR and sequencing techniques that are the gold standard for analyses of viral integrations. And, and this is the gap we're beginning to fill. With our targeted DGH Insight assays, we're bringing an orthogonal and complementary approach to these you know, gold standard PCR sequencing-based analyses to the market. So just how are DGH and PCR sequencing methods distinct and complementary? The gold standard approaches involve pooling DNA and bioinformatic reconstructions to predict structural re My apologies, my voice just gave out. <clears throat> Um, to predict structural rearrangements and, and calculate average vector copy numbers per cell. In contrast, DGH leverages uh, direct visualization um, of, uh, of targets on specially prepared chromosomes, and that enables a cellular and structural context of integrations and rearrangements to be established. <clears throat> Furthermore, we're really looking at an unbiased detection of integration events in this fashion. You don't need to know where to look. To measure the, the to measure the insert probes and viral integration sites can be tracked throughout the genome using only the target sequence. The probes are engineered to hybridize to only unique sequence, and so there's really negligible background, making for a really high signal to noise and and enabling this um, industry leading limit of detection. Uh, we're able to uh, routinely look at five kilobase pair targets, a little bit lower than that. Um, is is in the near term future, and we believe we're going to get down to a, you know a kilobase type range with some of the um, fluorescence enhancement type of approaches that we're developing. But you know this is really the type of low, lower limit of detection that's not possible with conventional um, hybridization in situ assay type probes. Um, however, at this point, I'd really like to emphasize that what we're talking about is a, a new tool that's right for a job that the existing gold standard isn't well suited for. We're not talking about displacement of DDPCR and, and the sequencing-based um, accompanying you know, approaches. This is now just a, an enhancement to the way of, um, of, of measuring. So let's do a little bit of a look at how it works. Um, you know, like I said, this is a combination of a proprietary cell preparation method and synthetic oligo probe design. And uh, by incorporating nucleotide analogs at the right time during cell division, we are able to you know, chemically differentiate the newly synthesized daughter strands. Uh, after a metaphase arrest, we can then strip away these differentiated strands, and that leaves us with the DGH prepped chromosome that consists of only the two anti-parallel parent strands. Our single-stranded oligo probes are designed against only one side of this, one direction of the reference sequence, and these bind to the unidirectional strands. This results in a fluorescence pattern map uh, of the target, and any rearrangements within a probed region are readily recognizable as out-of-place signal. So like shown here, a signal jumping to the dark chromatid can be readily scored as a, as a rearrangement, either an inversion or a sister chromatid exchange, depending on the context. That same signal jumping to a different chromosome would be a translocation, but we're also picking up uh, other complex rearrangements. We have the DAPI channel providing us uh, gross ploidy information, acentrics, dicentrics, other you know, complex damage. And all of this combined provides the structural data that is really a very comprehensive picture 
of the structural rearrangements throughout the genome in this single assay in single cells. Now, like G-banding or other cytogenetic techniques, the DGH assay requires dividing cells, but it's, it's also worth mentioning that for non-dividing cells, uh, we can still apply our synthetic probes in a fish format you know, with any samples that work with you know, regular fish. And again, due to the low background and, and low limits of detection, um, we have branded this uh, as pinpoint fish. So by creating these single-stranded metaphases to analyze with the PrEP, um, we have a lot of different assay options, uh, design options available to us. And shown here are three embodiments of DGH, each optimized for different applications. So we have targeted DGH insight. This is for small targets. It can be used for you know, gene-based probes. It can be used to bracket an on-target location, um, that type of thing. Lower limit of detection, as I said, currently, you know, three to five kilobases, maybe a little bit smaller than that. Um, no upper limit. Um, targeted probes can be really, you know, as big as they need to be. Um, we have DGH screen for unbiased assessment of larger rearrangements throughout the genome. And, and unbiased screen-based assays can focus on a single chromosome. They could be a subset of chromosomes, like our standard dosimetry, which, which uses, um, chromosomes one, two, and three paints to uh, basically create the statistical standard dosimetry assay that we use, um, or they can pull genome, and we will show a little bit of data for that. And I'll say that much of our custom assay work actually involves combinations of targeted and unbiased features. So um, finally, you know, our most advanced design currently in development, we call it DGH Discover. Um, this is leveraging banding by both color and um, the variable density that the probes kind of uh, are, are on the, in the paint. And um, these provide additional dimensions of data. This enables us to, um, detect, uh, to detect deletions and pin breakpoints um, a little bit more accurately. This is in development with some grant-funded work, um, and so please stay tuned as our developments progress there. Um, so here are some actual examples of DGH image data. Um, on the left, you can see the targeted approach, DGH Insight. What's going on in this particular uh, example is a double edit system within the same, um, within the same gene. There's about 12 kilobase pairs between the two edit sites, and we can readily pick up on, um, on uh, uh, inverted repair, as well as normal repair, as well as um, as well as a deleted um, sequence, all of which are are visible. In the middle, we have an example from our whole D, uh, whole genome DGH screen, where DGH probes are used on every chromosome, and rearrangements are identified and localized through a, a strategy of using five different colors, and we can identify the chromosomes through the combination of the color the centromere position and, um, and the size. And so uh, what you can see here in this particular cell is you know, a couple of inversions on chromosome one. We've got some aneuploidy missing chromosomes. This is probably a sister chromatid exchange on chromosome six and, and other things going on. Um, this is a known messy genome. This is actually the cell line from the NIST uh, genome in a bottle DNA from which that that genome in a bottle DNA was derived um, and you know these are immortalized cells um, turned over many times it was an undiagnosed disease patient with a very complex genome and and in a single experiment with whole genome DGH screen we were able to readily um, confirm the presence of other of known uh, rearrangements within the genome as well as discover, you know, a bunch of previously unreported inversions within that and, and characterize the mosaicism and heterogeneity of that complex sample in a way that uh, sequencing-based techniques just certainly would have had um, no chance of doing. So um, finally, um, just a little quick peek at uh, some actual DGH discover data. Um, this is going to enable multiple types of rearrangements and their breakpoints based on the um, based on uh, the, the, the banding going on with, with colors and the oligo density. So 
Okay, so there's the background I wanted to um, to, to establish. Um, thanks for your indulgence there. Um, I'm going to hand it over now to Lorraine to go over some data. Um, Lauren. Uh, thank you, Dave. So I'll be talking to you guys about a series of DGH experiments that we ran on induced pluripotent stem cells, or IPSC. These were in an edited IPSC line using a targeted knock-in approach where a 10 kb transgene was meant to be inserted on chromosome 22. All of the editing was performed by an outside collaborator and we performed the DGH assays at Chromatid. For this first experiment, we ran a combination of DGH insight with screen since these two approaches may be combined depending on the scientific question. For the insight portion, we have two components one probe that shows up in yellow and the other is in green. The yellow probe is designed against a 10, the 10 kb transgene and the green probe is designed against genomic sequence that brackets the target insert location at, on chromosome 22. In this way, we can differentiate and track on versus off target integration events across a population of cells. Any yellow event that co-localizes co with green, the green probe on chromosome 22 is counted as an on-target event, while any yellow event that is integrated on a non-chromosome 22 chromosome or on chromosome 22 outside of the green probe is considered off-target. We can also measure inversions on either targeted probe, as well as translocations of the green edit site. With this data, we can measure the pre prevalence of integration events on and off-target, the location of off-target events by chromosome, and the distribution of integration events by cell, and all of this is on a single cell basis. For the screen component, we have pink paints on chromosomes 1, 2, and 3, and this is meant to measure the background rates of rearrangements that may be generated during the establishment of the IPSC lines or editing-related events. Next slide. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so this slide is just meant to kind of show you what images we have available while we are scoring these uh, cells. So the first image is an overlay of all of the different color channels, as well as the DAPI channel, which is what we use as a counter stain um, to help us kind of orient where these integration events are occurring and on which chromosomes. We also have a breakdown of the different color channels available to us if we need to look at any of the individual probes um, kind of on their own. Uh, thanks. So uh, in this experiment, we have three different cell types that we assayed. Um, the first is the donor human uh, dermal fibroblast line, and this is the parental line from which the iPSCs were derived and established. And so when we put our assay on these fibroblasts, uh, we can see all of the uh, chromosomes 1, 2, and 3 showing up in pink, as well as the two homologs of chromosome 22 in green. And this is because these probes are designed against um, genomic human DNA um, and should show up in any human cells. Um, but we do not see the yellow insert probe, and this makes sense because these don't have the insert. And then the same is true of the unedited iPSCs. Uh, again, where we see the pink and green, but we do not see the yellow insert probe. And then here I'm showing you an example of one of the edited uh, cells in the edited population. Um, this cell had two integration events, both of which happened on uh, one homologue of chromosome 22, uh, and that's shown by the co-localization of that yellow and green probe. Um, this particular cell did not have any off-target events occurring in it. Uh, however, globally in this population, we did see a large and unexpected skewing towards off-targets. Um, and we were able to uh, report on this in kind of a percentage population-based uh, way. And in addition to the on versus on off-target data, we also saw 8% of the on-target inserts were inverted and we did detect one translocation of the green uh, edit site within this sample. So we wanted to take this uh, a step further and estimate the integration copy number per event that we are seeing in each of these cells. So it's similar to the first experiment, but this assay does not include a screen component since we already generated the rearrangement data in the previous set. It still includes the yellow insert and green bracketing probes that I mentioned earlier, 
and it also includes an internal size control probe. It's in the same color as the insert probe, so it will have the same fluorescent properties, and it will also show up as a yellow spot in these spreads. Uh, it is located on the chromosome eight, near the chromosome 8 centromere and is a known size and genomic location that should remain constant regardless of the treatment group. This gives us an internal calibrant signal, which will allow us to make some calculations to estimate the size of the inserts within each spread. This calibrant signal uh, is calculated per spread, and um, that allows us to account for any local differences across the slide. So per cell, we can normalize all insert and control signals to the number of fluorophores per KB. Um, this is constant and um, design, it's based on the design of the probes, so we have complete control over this. Um, and then we can compare the size and intensity of the insert signals to the control probe, again of known size and location, and then calculate the estimated integration copy number for each integration event. So in addition to all of the data that we generated um, using Insight for the first experiment, we also have that added information for estimated copy number per event. So here's another example of an edited uh, IPS cell using the assay that I just described. This cell had one off target event, which you can see um, as a yellow spot that occurs outside of the green probe, and then one on target event. It's a little bit hard to see, um, but the yellow probe is embedded kind of exactly in the middle of the green. Um, and then I also boxed the two internal size control probes on chromosome 8, so there's two homologs of that in this spread. Um, and then again, we get that kind of same dist uh, similar distribution in these cells um, as we did in the first experiment. Uh, so here I'm showing you the distribution of integration events per cell plotted against the percent of total cells analyzed. Uh, we determined the integration event number using some automated spot counting software that we have available in our lab. This is in line with our current goal of introducing automated image analysis to increase throughput of these types of assays. The automated spot counting software uses a composite image that combines all of the stacks that are acquired during imaging. In this way, we can get the best snapshot of each integration to use for analysis. However, we do have the individual stack images available to us for confirmation purposes. So anyway, using the results from the automated spot counting, we took the total number of yellow spots within each cell uh, minus the two internal control spots and plotted it out. And as you can see from this distribution plot, most of the cells which had an integration event fell within the one to seven range, although we did have cells with up to 12 indiv individual integration events. And the average um, of integration events per cell was about four in this experiment. Using the calculations that I alluded to a few slides ago, we then calculated the integrational copy number estimate per integration event. So note that this graph represents data per yellow spot, not per cell, and is plotted against the total number of spots analyzed. Uh, the pink bars represent the off-target uh, data points, and the yellow represents on-target. Most of the integration events fell at about uh, copy number of one, but we also detected partial and tandem inserts using this approach. And so we had an average ICN per integration event at about 1.6, and the average ICN per cell, which takes into account um, the ICN per integration event, as well as the total number of integration events per cell at about 7.8. So just to summarize, DGH can measure the rate of on versus off target insertions in a population, the number of integration events per cell, the estimated copy number per integration event, the inversions of inserts or other target genes, and the background levels of rearrangements due to editing. I've also provided a table here which illustrates the common techniques used to analyze integration location and calculate the average vector copy number. The, these techniques include whole genome sequencing and qPCR or DDPCR. Each technique is suitable for different types of analyses, but combined may synergize and give a more complete picture of what is going on inside an edited population. For example, by combining DGH insight with whole genome sequencing, one could get information not only on integration location, 
but also the distribution of integration events and rearrangements on a per cell basis within an edited population. Since the structural and cellular properties of an edited population are preserved during sample prep, using DGH allows for population analysis and provides distribution data for samples in a way that is not provided using sequencing techniques. It makes it easy to analyze both integration and rearrangement data in a single assay and can be performed using either a targeted or unbiased approach. We can tailor the design of each assay to accommodate the scientific needs of the experiment to, in order to provide the most meaningful data. And with that, I'll hand over the reins back to Dave. Great, thanks, Loren. Um, so you could see from that table that you know we're we're talking about a semi-automated, lots of manual input. This is this is still at the stage of its technology development that this is a um, you know a relatively low throughput process compared to the gold standard PCR sequencing based techniques. But we are committed to translating the platform capabilities described here by Loren into some into standardized automated high throughput assays that meet the turnaround times and, and cost expectations of the industry. And we want to provide uh, quantitative regulator ready assays that are gonna help our customers navigate development and, and frankly bring safer therapies to patients. And so um, what's shown here is a representation of a next generation DGH insight assay that's in development. Uh, we're again leveraging a five color strategy to enable chromosome identification you know, the, the color and the chromosome morphology enable us to identify. And, and this, along with the custom transgene probes uh, and the internal size controls, would afford a readout on a genome-wide basis of transgene distribution, could be parsed at the, at the chromosomal level, um, as well as uh, insertional copy number. And this genome-wide fingerprint can really then serve as a baseline for you know, tracking changes the composition of the, the population that's been modified, um, looking for signals of genomic instability, and you know, even the applicability in kind of a cell line QC kind of context is, um, is readily envisioned. So we've made great progress on the implementation of automated image analysis. These images are actually you know, relatively simple for um, AIs to, to, um, to figure out compared to some of the things they're expected to do. And that's clearly going to be, you know, the, the, the highest uh, yielding lever to pull on throughput and economics. So, um, uh, but an assay like this um, could run on instrumentation readily available to clinical labs and core facilities and even customer, you know, labs. And our goals are to scale this to drive the adoption of, you know, this type of testing uh, through transfer and support of uh, any testing site where our customers want to run DGH-based tests that need to utilize. And then as a final slide, um, I'll just bring it back to the types of you know, custom um, research, development, and testing um, project support that we do now and kind of walk through the, the flow of, of beginning and working through a project. And so everything really begins when a customer provides us the target information and really the guidance on what they care about measuring. Uh, if a custom probe is required, we can perform a design review at this stage and confirm the suitability of our probes. Um, there's usually at least one technical scope discussion where we flesh out exactly what the measurement objectives are and how many controls and active samples, et cetera, to include. And, and importantly, what level of sensitivity is required so we know how many cells to count. So from this stage, that gives us enough information to generate a quote. Um, once signed, we will provide a, a probe design description for approval by the customer, trigger probe factoring. Um, some things can happen in parallel to the manufacturing of the probe to sort of you know, coordinate the logistics and, and samples and things like that. Um, and really, once the project is underway, there is a fair bit of ongoing back and forth communication in the form of both you know structured project calls as well as you know one-on-one -on -one between you know the relevant stakeholders on both sides and really all of this is to put the the combined team in the best position to get the project right the first time so when we're underway we we look at a you know a representative fraction maybe 10 percent um, uh, of the data from the samples we'll generate a proposed sc scoring protocol We'll get together with the customer for an interim data review meeting. And out of this, 
an official scoring SOPs generated, signed off on by the customer, and we'll go back and finish things up. Ultimately, the deliverable is, um, you know, is a report. It, it breaks out graphs and quantitative information, narrative descriptions of what went on, um, uh, anything warranted by the scoring coach, and uh, some representative images. We get a lot of positive feedback from our customers on our collaborative approach and, and overall, you know, professionalism and effectiveness. And we're really very proud of the fact that virtually every customer that we've worked with um, who's been around long enough to do so has come back for additional projects. So we're passionate about inventing better ways of measuring genomic structure. And, you know, we'd be pleased to discuss how we might help any of you who are interested. Um, I think we transition now to a moderator-led Q&A. Um, Thanks to everyone for your interest and attention. Appreciate it. Thank you, David and Lauren, uh, for such an insightful presentation. Um, I'd like to open the floor for discussion. So remember to send us your questions using the chat feature on the platform. So um, I think the first question for us here is, uh, how can you tell whether a spot is integrated or not? Yeah. So. Um... Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we have pretty rigid criteria for accepting cells um, that uh, we choose to score. Um, and this criteria is also, um, as Dave mentioned, um, kind of related back to um, the person in charge of the project. Um, in order to kind of uh, determine whether this spot is integrated, um, there are certain spectral properties that we expect to see in a signal that's embedded in kind of that 3D structure because um, we are in the context of um, the whole chromosome. And so we use the image stacks and a couple other of like techniques to kind of um, determine whether it's something that's actually integrated inside the chromatin. So what's the smallest insert you can track? Right now, uh, we usually uh, set three to five KB as kind of our lower end. Um, we are working on some additional uh, design strategies to kind of boost the signal uh, and, like Dave said, drive down to about one KB. Um, but that's really dependent on kind of the local uh, sequence of that target, um, as well as some other. Um, design parameters um, in order to get down that low. And, yeah, uh, our probe design, our, our probe design technique relies on, um, you know, identifying unique sequence that aren't going, you know, that isn't going to produce background signal elsewhere in the genome. And so often, you know, um, uh, transgenes have some human sequence included um, if, and, and, you know, we have to exclude some non-unique sequence. And so limit of detection is always kind of case specific, but generally speaking, most of the things that we are coming across, um, as Loren said, that three to five kilobase is something we feel very comfortable proceeding forward with. And we're, we're working on um, signal amplification strategies to get us, uh, to get us below that as needed. Excellent. Um, does the plasma need to be virally delivered? No, it doesn't. We've we've done some experiments where it was a non-viral system, um, but we've also done a fair amount of experiments with viral systems as well. So, uh, we've got a question here from Marcus. Um, does your technology platform also allow to investigate non-integrated vector genomes on a single cell level, e.g., uh, an analysis of DNA fate of non-integrating vectors such as AAV? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, right now, it's not easy for us to um, to analyze non-integrated viral vectors, um, just due to the prep method and um, just how the the cells are laid out on glass. It's just hard to kind of distinguish um, the non-integrated vectors. Um, so yeah, at, at the moment, no. Um, can you also comment on uh, how optical mapping, such as bio-nanogenomics, compares with DGH? Yeah, um, 
That is a good question. Um, sorry, I'm trying to. Well, I, I believe there's a, a targeted component involved there. Um, and uh, yeah, th those are often um, brought up as as competitive, but in reality, the, we think of those as, as complementary. Uh, I know some of our customers have worked with um, with similar uh, or with those platforms on projects with us, and we're still at the table um, um, contributing uh, orthogonal, complementary information to anything that you know requires a targeted component to the assay. We have targeted, but we also have the ability to kind of look at um, an unbiased perspective as well. Excellent. Um, from Jeff, uh, if it seems like this platform is primarily applicable to ex vivo cell and gene therapy, do you have any in vivo experience evaluating biopsies or post-mortem tissue samples? Yeah, we, we've we actually done a fair amount of um, studies in FFPE uh, tissues. Um, and so, I mean, the, the experimental setup is different when we're uh, when we have that kind of a setup, um, because with like FFPE, you can't generate uh, metaphase spreads from those, obviously. And so the design and the things that we can do are different from kind of what I described in the um, experiment that I showed you guys. Um, but it is certainly possible. Yeah, many times we'll start with. Um you know, model cell lines do the DGH approach to um, get, helping the customer understand their system. And then we can adapt the probes to a fish um, sample and analyze, you know, we've, we've done distribution to tissues on, under, you know, um, a GLP type of uh, standard. So we can, um, yeah, we have, we have, we have a, I, I agree on the surface. It does appear that this is, you know, sort of pointed more toward ex vivo, but there are there are downstream opportunities to apply our technology to in vivo things as well. Um, from Hume, uh, once an integration event is identified, how uh, do you further pin down the precise integration coordinate? Yeah, so I mean, to to pin that down, um, we probably need to do a series of extra experiments to um, kind of understand that. Um, so something like Discover, or we could make some sort of targeted probes to that region, depending on where we see the uh, integration event on that chromosome, um, to kind of better figure out um, the sort of local area that that integration is happening. Yeah, I mean, it's realistically we get in the neighborhood and we get get down to where sequencing uh, does its job a little bit better. And mm -hmm. so that's how the combination of, of different um, technologies is really part of the overall answer. Um, what is the upper limit on total number of cells analyzed? Yeah, um, so we typically analyze um, in a non-clonal population uh, about 200 cells. This gives us a 90% confidence to find a 1% prevalence of an event. Um, so it really depends on um, kind of the experiment and what you're looking for. Um, so 200 cells is definitely doable. We can do more, um, but it would just affect kind of how long it takes to um, do that analysis. And like Dave was alluding to, we're really interested in um, introducing automation to kind of uh, increase our capabilities to analyze lots of cells in a population. Yeah, it's. I'll just add that, you know, 200 has been kind of the magic number across the across the sample of customers we've worked with in terms of you know the limit of detection that uh, the sensitivity rather that they care about and so like she said that'll get you to a pretty good idea if something is you know there at a one percent level or not and you know that does that does go back to the to the uh 
the notion, you know, this is also an approach to confirm the absence of something. And um, if you count 200 cells and you don't see anything, you get your 90% sure that it's not there. Excellent. We have one last question, which is, uh, can you also use your targeted probes to track changes around edit sites? Yes, we do that a lot. Yeah, um, yeah so in the experiment that I had today, um, you know, we had that green probe that bracketed the, the specific edit site. Um, and, you know, we've done other experiments where we have, you know, multiple edit sites that we can look at. Um, and then we can track rearrangements uh, um, that occur at either one or two or however many edit sites. Yeah, we can do a lot of different, you know, creative design strategies, putting uh, putting different color probes on either side of your edit site. Um, you know, your, the definition of changes is pretty material in this context. So we're not looking at, you know, small indels and things that still is in the, the purview of sequencing based approaches but you know two different colors on either side of your edit site um, is a really good tool for tracking edit site associated translocations for example fantastic and um, i think that is about all the time we have uh, we, for today so um that draws the webinar to an end uh, thank you very much for all your questions. And once again, thank you to Lauren, David, um, for this uh, excellent presentation. Thank you. Yep, thanks to everyone. All that remains to be said is have a great day and we look forward to welcoming you to one of our future events. Thank you very much.